Lighthouse. Welcome. I'm glad that everyone is here in the warm building where we can all be together. Um, I hope everyone had a safe couple of days home, hopefully. And I ask that you please stand and join us for worship. to me when it's too dark to see you. 
holding on to each and every one of us, Lord. When, when we're struggling and we're grieving, Lord, you're there to pick us up and guide us. And Lord, you're the first one we go to when we have good news. And you're the first one that we see in every waking moment, Lord. And we're just so blessed to have you each and every day. Lord, I just ask that you be with those that are grieving and struggling, those that are fighting the demons inside, Lord, those that they just, they don't know what, what they need, Lord, but they know they need you, and they don't know how to reach out. Lord, I just ask you to be with them. Hold them tight, Lord. Just be with those that are with us, Lord. Guide us, bless us, and continue to do all the great things you do for us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and grab a donut and a cup of coffee, and we'll see you back in just a few minutes.
Good morning, Lighthouse. I think uh, some of us have been snowed in a little bit because we're very talkative today. We're trying to catch up. I'd like to remind everyone that our Bible study is going to begin on March the 9th. It's on a Thursday night here in the Lighthouse. The books are $22 a piece. Uh, there's a book and also a study that goes along with it. And it's from 6 to 7.30. So if you would like a book, want to sign up, just call the church office or stop in uh, the church office. And then you have the rest. Okay. Okay. So this coming Sunday is the Super Bowl Sunday. We're at the Chili Cook-Off. So if you have not signed up, please do so. We need all the Chili Cook-Off people that would like to make their chili. Jim said he's real busy this week, so he may not be able to do it and Char might have to do it and we'll see what happens so so may oh he says that means you've got a shot he took a shot at Char just now uh but um Larry's not gonna be here so his chili's not coming but Nancy is she is coming she will be here so if you would like to defeat the champ Nancy Rolig, um I urge you to sign up uh and the sign up sheet is in the back if you have questions about the chili cook-off, you can always contact me or the church office, and I can um, help you there. This week, we are also doing uh, chocolate-covered strawberries for the youth group is in the after-school program. Kids, we are dipping strawberries this week. The coffee shop is taking all the orders. They're taking them in person and online, so if you'd like to place an order, you can do a full dozen, a half a dozen, get them for yourself, get them for your significant other. I don't care. Get them, get them for whoever you want. Um, but they're delicious. We are taste tested approved um, by all the youth kids. They think they're great. So um, the, there's information over in front of the donuts and on the front door about pricing and all of that. So if you have questions, see one of those areas. Uh, all the proceeds to that do go to the, um, to the backpack program that Janine and the ladies of the church, they do that. And it goes to the middle school, or yeah, the middle school and the elementary school kids that don't have any um, food on the weekends. They pack their bags full of food for the weekend. Uh, and the last thing, so we had a day recently that we weren't at church and because of COVID and a lot of, some people showed up at church because they did not get the information. So this is the one time you're allowed to get your phones out if you would like to get your phone out. But we have a text feature available now. And you can text a number. Oh, now I lost the number. It's coming up. Okay. The number is going to come up on the screen in just a second. It is 22300 is the number you send a text to. And you text the word alert and that will opt you in to receive text messaging from the Lighthouse in ILCC. And that's for any time um, that there is, maybe we're having an event and we're just reminding you that it's happening or if there's a reason that we need to cancel service or any of that. So it's not gonna happen a lot, but it will happen when we need to. So the number is 22300 and the word is alert. So send that text message and that will opt you in for our text messaging feature. All righty. Now, please stand and join us for one more song. Yeah. 
Our joys and concerns today, uh, we want to congratulate uh, Larry and Judy Perkins for celebrating 50 years of marriage this, uh, next week. So, congratulations to them. On our prayer uh, concern list, we have Dwayne Olson, Jim and Vicki Burchett, uh, Diana Wittes uh, broke her hand, Dee Bissett uh, had knee surgery, Ida uh, Hirschberger. We also have Bud Harrod who was a longtime member uh, years ago. Uh, they've been living in Lima for the last several years, but he is in hospice now. We also have Forrest McCune, who is Cindy Kratzenberg's dad, has heart um, um, procedures this week. Joe Tig, and also um, three of our grandchildren all have COVID, so we want to remember their, them in our prayers. Also, we have a, um, for fam family and friends of Jesse Lester, and Joe McDaniels, also um, the Shadwald family, the, uh, Sandra Malley, who is Bob and Norma Kreitzer's daughter, passed away. We also have Ron Griffith um, family. Uh, his service will be this Friday from 5 to 7 and Saturday uh, at 10 in Marion. Also, we have Chuck Coleman. Uh, I want to pray for Susan and her family. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before your presence with thanksgiving and rejoice that you are with us here on earth. Even though we have many struggles and temptations, and even though problems crowd upon us, we know that we are in your hands and everything must go according to your plan. 
We pray today for all those we have mentioned, for the families who are hurting and grieving. We pray also for those who, who are lost. We ask you to guide them and direct them and bring them into your, your family. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings you have given us. In his name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite the children to come with me. We're going to come over here to the nursery since it's so nasty out. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. <laughs> I'm going um, <clears> to <throat> wait for Karen to go in that room before I admit I wasn't entirely paying attention. So uh, if she didn't thank the trustees for showing up and shoveling this morning, thank you. <laughs> we had uh, about half a dozen of the trustees came up and shoveled snow and salted the sidewalks much better shape this week than the last time we had snow, so we appreciate all your help. And if Karen already announced that, please don't tell her I did it again, okay? <laughs> she says I don't listen, or something. I don't know, something like that, so. <laughs> there is an old adage that if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day, but if you teach him to fish, you can get him out of the house for the whole weekend. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but I love that saying because it's true, because people get obsessed with hobbies and things like fishing. But the thing that this misses is, I know just about as many women now who love to fish and are obsessed with fishing as I do the men uh, that like to fish. And so, in fact, there was this thing I found online this week, and it was a group of women uh, who have their own uh, fishing team, fishing group, and they have a slogan, women fish better than men and look better doing it. And, and so I thought, I am not touching that with a 10-foot fishing pole. I don't know who said that, but that's their motto, not mine. Regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, if you like to fish, then you can easily become obsessed with that. And once you become obsessed with that, then you know that <clears throat> you're caught up in the whole thing. And it becomes a matter of pride as to when you go out, when you catch fish, who catches the most, who catches the biggest, and all of that kind of thing. I have even actually had people tell me, I'm sorry I wasn't in church, but it is better to sit in a boat thinking of God than to sit in church thinking of fishing. And I said, I said you know, on the one hand, I'm like, all right, you got a point, but... On the other hand, just this general feeling, knowledge of the presence of God and God in creation is a wonderful thing, but it also kind of has to go with learning the word and the instruction and everything else that goes with it. It's kind of a and, not an or, if you will. And so, yes, a boat is a wonderful place to experience God. Don't skip church to do that. That's my opinion. So, But the thing about anybody that fishes, men or women, they have fishing stories. And some of the best stories I have heard are from people about the one that got away. <laughs> And usually, I don't believe a word they say, but this impressive story about the one that got away. And, and it's kind of neat because in the Bible, there are fish stories. You know, when you think about Jonah a, a being swallowed by a fish for three days and then spit up on land, that is, you can't top that, all right? I don't care what you guys have done, what you have caught, almost caught, seen, or anything else. You've never been swallowed by a fish for three days and spit up on land. I'm sorry. And if you tell me that, I won't believe it, all right? So that's like the best fishing story ever. Then we have the, uh, um, the story in the Bible about the temple tax coin, when Jesus has to pay the temple tax. And he sends Peter down to catch a fish, and he says, when you catch the fish, the coins will be in the mouth. Sure enough, Peter catches a fish, opens up the mouth, and there's the coins to pay the temple tax. And that was pretty cool. Then we know that Jesus, on two different occasions, fed thousands of people with just a few loaves and fishes, and he multiplied those so that they were able to feed everybody, and they ate until they had their fill, and some was left over. So there's another example of fish in the, in, in the Bible. But also in the early church, early Christians, they faced a lot of persecution. And in this persecution, they had to be secretive. And so you've seen the fish symbol, you know, that a lot of people like to have on their car or different things, uh, which are really neat. That started out in early Christianity. And the reason for that was they were being persecuted. So this was a sign of a place of Christian worship, but it was a secret symbol. It was a place of a tomb, uh, maybe of a follower who had been... Um, buried in a particular place and was a Christian, they had that symbol on there. Or if you met a stranger and you weren't exactly sure, as you're talking to them, you can draw half of that ark in the sand. And if they were to draw the other half of the ark and complete the fish, then you knew they too were a Christian. And you could talk about this without risking your life and limb in the persecution. And so the idea of fish and fishing plays a very big part 
in the life and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know at least four or five of the disciples uh, were fishermen. Could have been more. We're not exactly sure. But we know that uh, James and John, Simon, Peter, uh, they were all fishermen. Andrew was a fisherman. And so James and John, uh, they were uh, the sons of Zebedee. Jesus later calls them the sons of thunder because they're always wanting to, you know, uh, uh, they're always wanting to, you know, bring the hammer down on people. And so you've got uh, Simon Peter, you've got James and John. They're all a part of the same group, if you will. They work together in their fishing. And, and so one day Jesus is walking along the beach and he sees a crowd of people. And as he sees this crowd of... Something in my pocket. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's a chili cook-off medal winner. How did that get in there? I don't... <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, that's weird. I don't know how that got in there. Huh. I must not have worn these pants since the last chili cook-off. I don't know how that happened. In the Gospel of Luke, in the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were there washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, and they left everything to follow him. So picture this scene, if you will. James, John, Peter. It's in the morning. They've been out fishing all night. And the reason they fished at night was because in the darkness, usually the winds were calmer. And when they threw their nylon nets, it wasn't as likely to spook the fish that would see them. And for some other reasons, as far as, you know, selling the fish in the morning for the day's catch and all of these things, they would work through the night fishing. And so then in the morning, of course, anybody that fishes knows you've got to take care of your tackle, right? So they had to clean and mend their nets every morning to prepare for the next night's fishing. And this is where they're at when Jesus finds them. They're, they're standing there on the shore, and they're working their nets, and they're cleaning their nets, and they're getting ready to finish up for the day and go to their homes. Jesus walks up, and he sees a crowd of people, and he did as he likes to do. He wanted to teach them. And so he looked at them, though, and the crowd begins to press in around them. And so rather than being crushed by this crowd, he steps into one of the boats, and the boat happens to be Simon Peter's. And he says, will you put out from shore a little bit so that I can teach? Now, in that day, the rabbis liked to teach sitting down. And so when the boat was pushed out from shore just far enough, Jesus sits down in the boat, and he begins to preach to the people that are on the shore. And as he's preaching to them and teaching them, as he's done, he looks at Simon Peter, and he says, why don't you put out into deeper water? Throw your nets down and see what you catch. And Peter says, Lord, look, we have fished all night. We have not caught a thing. We have wasted our time, we're tired, but if you say so, we'll try it again. Now, I can tell you as somebody who has worked third shift, the last thing you want to do when you get done working third shift is to go back and work some more. That is the last thing you want to do. You want to go home and go to bed. But Jesus tells him, put out into the deeper water and drop your net. Now, the interesting thing is Peter knew Jesus because Jesus had called him once before and Peter had followed. But at some point, Peter had gone back to fishing with James and John. And so while he knew Jesus, he respected him. He thought he was a great prophet and a teacher. He didn't fully understand exactly who Jesus was. So when they put out from shore into the deep water and they cast their nets out, they had bell-shaped nets that were about 15 feet in diameter with weights along the edges. And when that, when that net would cascade down, the idea was that it would come down over the fish and you would pull the rope, it would draw the string shut, and then the net would close around whatever fish were there. Think about this. All night, 
cast after cast, nothing. And then Jesus says, let down your nets, and they do. First cast, they put the net down, they whap it, they pull it up, and there are so many fish in the net that they cannot bring the fish into the boat. There are so many fish there that they have to call their partner boat to come and help them. And then when they start putting the fish into both boats, there are so many that the boats begin to sink. It's called the miraculous catch for a reason, okay? Not the immaculate reception. I think that was the Steelers at one point or something, but this is the immaculate catch, uh, uh, and it's a miracle. And, And so once this miracle happens, Peter realizes that Jesus is more than what he thought he was. Now, once he knows that he has dropped this net down in there and he knows that he has caught this amazing amount of fish, if you're like any other fisherman, you're thinking from now on, that's my spot. That's where I fish and I'm not telling anybody else about it. I know Bob Kreitzer has fished this lake for 70 or 80 years and he's always catching fish. And I say, Bob, where are they biting today? And he says, Indian Lake. That is all he will ever tell me. He won't tell me where, just Indian Lake because everybody's got their spot, and they don't share those. Last summer, I was walking past the harbor down here at Russell's Point, and there were two guys in a rental boat. Had the marina thing there on the side, and, and I walked by, and they had stringers of fish. It was amazing. I mean, they had an unbelievable catch, and I got to talking to them. And I said, do you guys live around here? And they said, no, we're from out of town. We just came and rented the boat so we could go out fishing. And I said, that's an amazing catch. And he said, yep, next time we're in town, we're going back to the exact same spot. And I said, well, I would too. I said, but are you sure you're going to be able to find it? And they said, we marked the spot so we know where it's at. (laughs) Good deal. I said, how did you mark the spot? And the guy says, we put an X right on the side of the boat, right where the spot was. (laughs) And I looked at him, and I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, what if you don't get the same boat next time? Then what are you going to do? And then they felt silly after that. I mean, it was just, you know, they couldn't know where their spot was. Sorry, that always cracks me up. (laughs) Anyways, so Peter, James, and John, wait a minute, what's it? Oh, man, (laughs) another chili cook-off medal. Where did that come from? Jeez. Sorry, guys, I didn't mean to distract you over there. I just, you know. So Peter, James, and John, when they see this miraculous catch of fish, all right, as soon as they see this miraculous catch of fish, they have the realization that Christ is not merely a prophet or a great teacher. He's something more. He's something special. He could be who he says he is, and it would be a long time before they even begin to understand who that is. But once they realized he was more than they thought that he was, it changed everything. And this time, unlike before when they were called, there was no turning back. Once Peter, James, and John had seen Christ revealed, the first thing Peter does is he drops to his knees. And once he drops to his knees, he says, Away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus says, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Now think of this idea, this concept. Away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When actually what we should be thinking is, Come here, Lord, let me come to you because I am a sinful man. Wasn't Peter's first reaction. Peter's first reaction was, away from me, for I am a a sinful man. Now, as the Gospel of Matthew says, Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. And it's kind of cool. Every summer, there's a tournament, fishing tournament out on the lake. And the night before the tournament starts on Friday night, we have a dinner here in the lighthouse. And the ladies prepare this uh, wonderful meal. And all of these people come in. There's like a kajillion dollars worth of boats and trucks out in the parking lot, right? And they're all in here before the start of this tournament. And it's a tournament that's put on by a group called the Fishers of Men. And so the night that they get together before the tournament to do all of the busy work and to get everything registered and do all that kind of thing, we have a banquet here. And and right before the banquet, I'll give a short message. And after that short message, I'll make an invitation for those who don't know Christ to come to know Christ. And then they will proceed with their meeting. And then they will pair people up. And then they will send them out onto the water to fish the next day. And I think that is just the coolest concept because it ties in the fisher of men with the idea that no matter what we do, whether we're working, we're playing or anything else, we're doing it as if we're doing it for the Lord, because whatever we're doing, work or play, God is at work. And and God cares about the mundane parts of our lives. When Peter first fell down on his knees in front of Jesus, he realized his insignificance into relation with God. 
Compared to God, he was insignificant. That's the first thing he realized. But once Peter saw this miraculous catch of fish and that Jesus cared that deeply about the mundane aspects of what he was doing, then he realized that the important thing wasn't his insignificance compared to God, but it was his significance to God as a child of God. And that's when everything started to fall into place and Peter really began to understand what was going on. His initial response was to feel that insignificance in in comparison to God's greatness, which we all should do in all experience. But the second thing is Peter was amazed that God on high cared about him, cared about his day, cared about his routine, and understood his needs. And so with this miraculous catch of fish, think about this, this miraculous catch of fish, more fish than they have ever caught or seen at one time in their lives. They have been blessed beyond measure in that means. And what do they do? Because we are blessed beyond measure in many ways in our lives. And I'm not just talking material blessings. If we only focus on material blessings, then we're not focusing on the right things. When we talk about our family, when we talk about our friends, when we talk about security, when we talk about love and hope and all of these types of things, and yes, the material things in there as well, We run the risk sometimes of getting so enamored with all of our blessings and so comfortable in all of our blessings that we become apathetic towards God himself who is the miracle worker and the giver of all blessings, and that's sad. We focus and become so comfortable with what we have and what we experience that we ignore the one who provided it. Luckily, Simon Peter, James, John, they didn't focus on the miracle They didn't get caught up in what God had given them, the miracle that had been performed. They sought the miracle worker himself, and that is so much more important than the aspect that we take and the approach we have on life. It wasn't this wonderful blessing, this miracle that we have, but they focused on the one who had done the miracle work. And we see so many different instances of this in the Bible where there is a call, and it it plays out this way. Uh, The prophet Isaiah In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. One day, Isaiah sees himself, finds himself standing before the throne of God and sees him in all of his glory. And the first thing he thinks is, I am going to die. I don't deserve to be here. I am a sinful man. I live among sinful people. I have no right to stand before the Lord my God. And they bring down this burning coal with a pair of tongs, and they take it, and they touch it to his lips to purify him. And they say, see, your sins are atoned for. And then God says, Whom shall we send for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. That was his calling. It started with being overcome by the awe and the wonder and majesty of God, and then it moved into other realizations and other priorities. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 11, when Paul talks about his calling, when he talks about when he talks about uh, the way that Jesus approached him and, and his insignificance. One of the things he says is, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, And last of all, he appeared to me also to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preached and this is what you believed. 
See, Paul's talking about when he's on the road to Damascus and he had these letters and he was going out and, and he was going to arrest the followers of Christ and he was going to persecute them. He was going to put them in chains. He was going to beat them, humiliate them. He was going to bring them back to Jerusalem. He was going to uh, imprison them and possibly they would die. That was his goal. That was his mission. So he's on the road to Damascus to carry this out. And he's on his donkey. And all of a sudden, he's blinded. And he's knocked off his donkey. And he's laying there on the ground. And he hears this voice. It says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said the same thing any of us would say. Who are you? And he says, I am Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. And he says, you are to go into the town. You're to wait instructions. And I will tell you what you're to do. And they led Paul into the town, and he goes into a house, and for three days he is blinded. He doesn't eat, doesn't drink. He just sits there and prays and meditates on everything that had happened and the glory of God that had spoken to him. And so then God talks to Ananias, and he says, you need to go over, and you need to go to this house, and you need to pray for Paul, and you need to give him the Holy Spirit. And Ananias says, okay, that's a good idea, but here's another idea. What if I don't? Because this Paul guy was sent here to persecute us and arrest us and take us back and beat us and possibly kill us and all these things. I don't think Paul's going to want to see me. Jesus says, he has seen in a vision that a man with your name is going to come to him. And now he must learn how much he will suffer for my name. And so that's what happens. Ananias goes to the house and he prays and something like scales fall off of, the, of Saul's eyes and he begins to see. And from that point forward, he becomes one of the most prominent figures in the New Testament in the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to a world in need. He gave up a life of prominence and importance and power and authority and all of these things that he had. He gave up his comfort, his good standing and his prestige and he leaves it all to serve for the sake of Christ. And in this passage from Corinthians, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am the least of the apostles. I am one abnormally born. And by that, what he means is the way I came to see Christ and to know Christ was different from the rest of the apostles. I was abnormally born. I am what I am. Now, Papa I used to go around saying, I am what I am. And he owed all that to spinach, right? Which was a wonderful thing. Paul says, I am what I am, but he gives it all to the grace of God. I am what I am, not because of me, but because of the grace of God, and that is extremely more powerful. Three lessons that we learn from all this, all right? And the first is this. Peter, James, and John, and possibly, you know, with, with Andrew, if they were part of that group, they followed Christ to a point, and then they fell back, and then they went to fishing. Jesus came back, revealed himself to them and called again and they left and never looked back when they had that miraculous catch of fish and they left to follow jesus i picture them dumping the fish back into the sea of galilee and following jesus the biggest catch and release you have ever heard of in your life right they just put all the fish back but here's the thing about jesus once he has us once he catches us he does not let us go there is no catch and release. Once we're caught, we're his. And he will never let us go. No matter where we wander, we can always return. Because we turn, and he is there. Peter, James, and John, three of the disciples turned from Jesus, went back to fishing. Jesus came back and reached to them, revealed himself to them, and they followed, and they never looked back. We can always turn and follow, no matter where we're at in our lives. The second thing is this. Notice how Isaiah, uh, Peter, and Paul, uh, and, and I have to be careful there. Sometimes I say Peter, Paul, and Mary, and that just doesn't work at all. But, but Isaiah, Peter, and Paul, when they first see God, they see the biblical view of God as him high and lifted up, which is how we should encounter God for the first time and subsequent times after that. We should see the glory and the power of God. We should see him as high and lifted up. We must see his glory. We must, like them, recognize our own significance in comparison to God. We must realize that, like Isaiah, like, like Paul, like Peter, that we are not worthy. We are sinful men and women in the presence of God Almighty. But that's just a starting point. That is just a starting point. Because the third thing that we need to remember is so important, and that is we are not worthy, okay? That's the whole point. Christ makes us worthy. That's the whole point. Realize that 
According to C.S. Lewis, God does not love us because we are good. But God makes us good because he loves us. All right? It's a different way of thinking. God doesn't love us because we're good, but he makes us good because he loves us. And if we're going to, like, like uh, uh, Peter says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. See, that's the same idea I have. I'm going to start to the gym as soon as I get in shape, you know? I don't want to go until then. And, and, and like if you're sick and you're like, I'm going to go to the doctor as soon as I feel better. It makes no sense. Peter says, away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. When he should be recognizing that that is the man, the one man who can claim his sin and take it all away. He doesn't love us because we deserve it, because we're good. He makes us good, makes us worthy because he loves us. And you can't let go of that thought no matter what's going on in your life. God doesn't do the whole catch and release thing. When we're his, we're his for all eternity, all time. Can't turn back. And while we must recognize first and be awed by his glory, we must also yet be humbled by the idea that he cares for the most minute and mundane aspects of our lives every day. That is so hard to reconcile, that the glory and the power and the majesty of God, it's the same God, the same power, the same being who loves everything about us and loves even the most mundane things in our lives. I was thinking, oh, what's this in my pocket? What is it? <laughs> no, I haven't won that one yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's right. We'll talk in our meeting this week. <laughs> well, let me leave you with this. Henry David Thoreau said, many go fishing all their lives without knowing that it is not fish that they are after think about that you know many go fishing all their lives without knowing that it is not fish that they're after something deeper something more something yeah almost kind of spiritual when you're there when you're that into it and you're even connecting with God in the wilderness what is it that we're after the same thing is true though that many live their lives not knowing that it is God that they are seeking and not knowing that God is seeking them and if we don't know that how can we turn and fall on our knees in front of the glory and the majesty of God? If we're not seeking him and we don't realize he's seeking us, we're going to miss the mark. Our job is to tell them. Our job, like Peter, James, John, Andrew, the rest of the disciples that were sent out and given the Great Commission and all of these things, our job is exactly like he said to Peter. Our job is to embrace God to realize that we are good and worthy, not on our own, but because he loves us, and then to go out into the world the same way and to be fishers of all people. That's our job. One of the best ways... Sorry, i got to lose the bling here. One of the best ways for us to begin that journey, one of the best ways to let go of the fact that we are insignificant compared to God is to once again realize our significance to God. And every time we come to the table, we break the bread, we drink the cup, we forgive our sins, we embrace the promise of forgiveness and everything that comes with it. Every time we do this, we are remembering that we are significant to God, so much so that he sent his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me invite the elders to come forward and offer the prayers for the bread and the cup.
We know that our Lord Jesus Christ is the host at the communion table. We know that the scripture assures us that if we confess our sins, that our God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we also know from the Apostle Paul that we are to spiritually prepare ourselves before we eat the bread and we drink the cup. Because the scripture does assure us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. When we approach the table with the right manner, with the right mindset, with the right heart. So let us first silently make our prayers and our humble confessions to Almighty God. And now as our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was handed over to suffering and death, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite you now to come forward through the center aisle to receive the body and blood of Christ.
same attitude as Peter when he dropped on his knees and just recognized that he wasn't worthy, that he wasn't worthy to be in your presence, Lord, but as he gave himself to you, you made him worthy. You made him, Father, who he was, and you can do the same for us. We ask, Father, uh, that while we remember your power, your majesty, and your glory, and we can times feel insignificant in this world, in this place that we live, that we have great significance to you. Fill our hearts and spirits that we might go into the world and to do your work, and to bring others to know you, and to carry out your commission. Father, we're grateful for the work that you have done. Help us as we continue to do more. In Jesus' name, amen.